behind the soundboard and stuff, known him for a bunch of years. And when you look at the biblical uh, requirements for an elder, you know, Matt meets all of them. He is a, a man who is faithful to the Lord. He is faithful in serving his family. Uh, and I know he's going to be faithful in serving the church. You know, when we asked him, he's not somebody who just, oh, yeah, I'll do that. You know, he prayerfully considered it for months and months. Yeah, right, well. right. <laughs> weeks and like weeks. Months. I think it was at least a month and a half. Uh, but, you know, he goes to the Lord with it. And that's what you want to see. I'd get nervous if we asked somebody to be like, yeah, all right. You know, I'd be nervous about that. So he prayerfully considered, can I meet these responsibilities? Can I, can I uh, just serve the body at research is the way that they need to be served. So... We really believe Matt's going to be doing that, so we want to just lay hands on him and pray for him. You guys can extend a hand to him. This is uh, your elder team here with James, Matt, and Carl, um, just really to serve the church. That's that's what we're about, so let's do that. Father God, you know all things before we know them, Lord, and you know that you have uh, anointed and appointed Matt for this position. We praise you, Lord, for his life, for the faithfulness that you have worked in him, Lord, for the holiness that you have worked in him, Lord, for his family. We pray, Father, as he steps into this role, that it would be a blessing to the church. It would be a blessing to you, Lord, that it wouldn't be a strain on his family, that you would give him even time management, like super skills, Lord, that he would know how to how to balance everything. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the call that you've placed on his life. And we just install him now, Lord, as an elder over this local body at Resurgence Church. Lord, we commission him in your great work, in the work of serving you and serving your body, Lord, being your hands and feet. We thank you for his life, thank you for his faith, and thank you, Lord, most of all, for what you are doing in building up your body here in this church. We praise you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So if you don't know Matt yet, get to know him, invite him over for dinner. He's got a bunch of kids <laughs> and a bunch of allergies, so That's you really funny. can't eat anything. Uh, yeah. So, uh, oh, one other thing I wanted to just give you a heads up for. We are going to release the kids in just a second, but we're dealing with some, some side space issues. So we're potentially going to be making another space for kids, but uh, we, we we're talking, we're going to invite the kids back in with us at um, communion time. So I just wanted to give you the heads up ahead of time. We'll kind of knock on the door. The kids will come back in for communion. So families, we leave it up to you, you know, as far as uh, your convictions with your children. Take <laughs> communion if they're old enough. They know what's going on. It's a family thing. It's often a time of breaking bread as a family, which I love the idea of the kids being in here with us. And us as parents, not leaving it to somebody else to teach you, but that, that's our role as parents, right, is to teach and train up our kids and say, son, daughter, this is, this is what this is. You know, and, and maybe they don't get it perfect, but this is what it is, and, and we give it to them, and we break bread together as a family and as a church. So I just wanted to give you the heads up there. Um, so we got nice light seats, so juice stains will be everywhere, I'm sure, but that's okay. You know, All right, so children, kindergarten through fifth grade, you are dismissed uh, with Miss Sarah into the kids' room. Um, if you want your child to stay with you for service, you are always welcome to have him stay with you for service. Now, I'm super excited to invite up Elder James, uh, who's going to be bringing the word for us today. Mother's Day to all our mothers, soon to be mothers, grandmothers. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day, Mom. My mother's here. <laughs> Funny story, when I, I called her up to tell her that I was gonna be speaking today, and um she's like, oh, okay, you know, I you know, I promise I won't be too loud with my amens and stuff. Because she's a very out if you don't like extra if you don't know if she's one of those extra um you know, if you guys don't know, I'm a little like this. So, like, what she doesn't know is as I'm asking, I'm like, my mind, I'm reverting back to when I was a kid, like, playing ball. So I'd be on the field, and I'd be up at the plate, and I'd, you know, I'd hit the ball. And all you hear is, run, run, Jake, go, 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 go. 
And like I'm that kid that's like, and I'm like, I never wanted to hit more than a single. I just wanted to get to the, I just wanted to get the first base. I didn't want to hit a double because I, you know, my, I was just so in, like embarrassed. <laughs> I was just, you know, because I was just that type of kid. It was, just, it was just, it was that's funny. funny. It was funny. And he quit because of that. <laughs> But, um, so we're going to be continuing the series that Pastor Mike um, started last week, um, the Shadow series, seeing Christ portrayed in the um, in the Old Testament. Um, we're going to be looking at the story of uh, Cain and Abel. Um, so, with that, I think we have the uh, scripture. Looking at Genesis four. Um, um, Yes, we do have it up there. Okay, Genesis 4, 1 through 5, we're going to be reading. If you guys all want to stand with us as we're reading on the word, I guess we'll read it together. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the Lord, with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. Let's just pray. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the opportunity, God, just to speak forth your, your word today, Lord. God, I just pray, God, that um, you would just be glorified, Lord, that you would just be seen as great today as uh, we just go through this passage of Scripture. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So, um, <clears throat> how it would Cain... Um, when I was first preparing for this, for the message, um, how this came about with Cain and Abel, was um, I was I was online. I was reading this article online. It was about worship, and um, after the article, you know how they have like you can make comments online. You can um, say what what, what the people thought about what was going on. So people commenting about this article on worship and you know saying this and that. And someone brought up Cain and Abel. This was a few weeks before Mike asked me to speak about it. So. Um, they're going, and what happened was that what they were commenting on became all about Cain and Abel. They started, there was like a uh, kind of like a bickering going back between Christian people talking about um, what, what Cain and Abel, what it meant to sacrifice is this and that. And I'm just like, man, these people like really it felt like missing the point here and what's going on. And then there was this one woman who chimed, I say woman, her name was, was Bible Girl. And um, she was, uh, she just came in with this short little thing and was just like, you know, just said something that was so Christ exalted in the whole thing to like kind of just bring a clarity in it. And still there was like people like the Christian were like bickering, you know, like just trying to like make a point that, oh, this is not saying that, it's not saying this. And it, and um, it, I was kind of taken back because you could see like there was like an animosity even though they were speaking be between brothers and sisters in this and because they were, they were looking for other things other than Christ in, the, in it. And when you look for other things other than Christ, d d device division comes in there, Amen. you know, when he's not Very at good. the center of our lives. So as I looked at this, I was like, man, I, I want to join. I was going to like sign up like real quick. I didn't know how to do it like name myself Bible man or something to come in and, just, <laughs> and just like, just decide with this, you know, like, what are, what are you guys, you know, looking at? This is the, you know, so, but anyway, so it was like from five years ago, so it was like, who even knows what's going on with that? But, um, so that's what started me looking into more of the uh, Cain and Abel and what, um, the story about it, what actually, you know, is going on, what this picture, what it portrays in scripture, so... That's how I got to, you know, I got studying. I just want to share with you guys basically what, as I was going through this, what the Lord put on my heart through it. So um, starting in verse 1, we have, you know, at this point in Scripture, Adam has relations with his wife. She gives birth to Cain and Abel, right? The fall of Adam and Eve has already happened, and sin has now entered the world through one man's transgression, through Adam. And because of one man's act of disobedience, we are all made sinners. Yeah. But as we know, 
by one man's act of obedience, many will be made righteous, right? Romans 5, 19 says. So sin is now passed down from Adam through the generations up until now, Cain and Abel being conceived, conceived in sin, Cain actually being the uh, first recorded child with an inherited sin nature. Along comes Abel, his brother, born a sinner, just like his older brother Cain. And I was thinking about this, I was wondering how like Adam and Eve must have, must have felt, you know, when giving birth to their kids and they first see their kids manifest that sin, that sin nature, you know, the, the guilt they must have felt, you know, inside, like this is, this is our doing kind of, you know, our kids are like, and I do the same thing, I see my kids like, you know, acting in a negative way and I'm just like, oh, that's so me right there, you know, I'm just like, oh, oh, you know, I just feel like, you know, it's disheartening. So anyway, we have two brothers being born under the curse of sin and death and both need, being in need of redemption, okay? So in mentioning this, I want to show from the scriptures how Abel's offering, which was an expression of his faith, right, shows the scriptures to be true of him being redeemed and declared righteous and why Cain's offering shows him to be seen as an unrighteous man lacking any type of faith at all. Another point I want to make is to show how Abel, Abel's offering of the first of the flock foreshadows that of Christ and his sacrifice for us. And lastly, to take time to, as we take time to look at the life of Abel, we'll see how he himself is portrayed as a type of Christ. I'm looking for Joe because he said he's building us a, a pulpit. This thing's like all shaky. So, Jesus said in John 5, 39, you study the scriptures thoroughly because you think in them you have eternal life. And it's these same scriptures that testify about me. And uh, Mike actually, you know, spoke on this last week. It says, you know, my heart for you and I in this series is that we would see the testimony of Jesus Christ throughout the scriptures as we study on our own, as we look into the word, as we're looking at it, that we would see Christ, especially in the, in the Old Testament because that's, that's what they had at that time. That's what Jesus was pertaining to. So as we look at the scriptures, having the mind of Christ, seeing it through the eyes of the gospel and the lens of the new covenant, we'll be continually seeing Christ and his gospel made manifest throughout the word of God. So moving on to a verse two, it goes on to give the occupations of the two brothers. It says that Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and that word keeper in the Hebrew is translated to tend, to feed, or to shepherd. So we see that Abel was a shepherd of the flock, and not really sure during the prim this like primitive time what the job of a shepherd would entail, at this point, since it was after the fall, it's possible animals maybe started eating animals at this time. Um, they may have needed protection from predators that were coming along. If he was keeping them, he would obviously, they would obviously need to be fed, be led to water, to be cared for however way they needed to be cared for. Jesus says in John 10, 11, he says that he's the good shepherd, as Abel here is a type who lays his life down for the sheep referring to us as a sheep. He's staining us by his word, leading us beside still waters and down right paths for his name's sake, mm -hmm. bringing us near when we once were far off by the shedding of his precious blood, mm -hmm. making us secure in his fold where no one, no one can snatch us from his hands. Mm -hmm. So why would Abel, after all, become a shepherd? What would be the reasoning to have a flock? After all, they weren't used for food during this time period. God didn't command the eating of any animals till after the flood. I believe, for one, they needed sheep for clothing. They needed to be covered, as Pastor Mike talked about last week, about the skins that God provided for Adam and Eve. The wool from the sheep would have provided them with clothing. Two, they would have been used maybe for, for milk, to drink, maybe make cheese, I don't know. And thirdly, I would most definitely think they would be used to offer for sacrifice. Now, the scripture says of Cain that he was a tiller or worker of the ground. In other words, he was a farmer. 
His job was to cultivate the field so that it would bring forth its herb for food. And I say herbs because part of the cursing of the ground that was pronounced in Genesis 3.18 was that they would have to eat the herb of the field. No longer would they have the delicacy of eating the delicious, sweet fruit trees they once had in the garden. Mm -hmm. God said to Adam, cursed is the ground for your sake. In the toil, in toil you shall eat it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb or plant of the field. And I tried to look up this word herb and real, what it meant it, in Hebrew. Or maybe Carl would have a better idea. I don't know, but it's, it's, but it's like, like a green, like a plant, a green plant or something. I don't know if it was like spinach, kale, like, you know, it was, I don't know if it consisted of just green vegetables or something, but which I like, spinach and kale, but I guess a steady diet and that wouldn't be, uh, you know, for my stomach, it wouldn't work out too well. But that's what they had, and, um, that's what their food was. It was part of the curse. They no longer had that, you know, delicacy of eating like that, like they once had. In the garden, there was, there was no toiling. Everything brought forth food on, his, on its own as God created it to do. It was a place of rest. Man was placed there to tend it, pick fruit, right? Eat of the fruit, maybe trim back a branch or two that more fruit would grow. It was there for the pleasure of man. But after the fall, it was herbs only to eat, or plants. And the ground took some working to get it to produce a crop now. And we do see now a remnants of that curse nowadays that was pronounced in the garden, but not like it was during the time from Adam to Noah. <coughs> we have thorns, we have weeds, we have to turn over our ground when we get our garden started and stuff. But during the time period from the fall of Adam to Noah, there had to be a major difference in what the ground looked like originally and also to what it looks like for us now. You may say, what makes you say that? Well, if you, you look at the scriptures pretty much anywhere in the Old Testament, whenever there was famine, where God held back the rains and the land became unfruitful, it was a sign of his divine judgment on the land, usually due to sin. And it was the same thing that happened when Adam sinned. God cursed the ground, saying, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat it all the days of your life. And so it stopped yielding its fruit, except by the working of one's hands and the sweat of the brow. And also, if you look at Genesis 5.29, it says, says of Noah... This one will bring us comfort from our labor and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. And again, in Genesis 8, 21, after the flood recedes, Noah makes peace offerings that pleases the Lord. And the scripture says, the Lord said, and saw, I will never again curse the ground <coughs> because of man. And my point in saying all that is to show that it must have took a lot of work during that time, Right? A lot of pulling out of thorns, cut up hands, a lot of plowing of the fields for the earth to bring forth its fruit, right? So if someone saw Cain working in the field, they would say, wow, this guy is, he's a hard worker. He's, and rightfully so, he was. And some of you might be saying now, I, I see where he's going with this. And I believe this story to be the first account of what it is to be justified by faith versus seeking to be justified by works. In other words, trying to be accepted or approach God based on one's own merit, one's own basis of their good works. Um, I'm good enough. I did the right things. I, I, I'll make it. You know, I'm good. <clears throat> Last week, Pastor Mike showed from the scriptures how Adam and Eve tried to cover up their sin by making loincloths out of fig trees. They were trying to covering up, cover up their sin by their own works. Mm -hmm. And now here we have one brother, Cain, looking to be accepted by God by his works. And then Abel, who gave his offering in faith, right? Who we must, must have learned from his parents. You know, I would assume the whole, Mike explained last week that, uh, that for those of you who weren't here, that the, um, when uh, they did sin, they said the Lord covered them with skins. You know, so obviously an animal had to be killed mm -hmm. for them to be covered. Um, which... In that, it points to someone greater, and we know who that greater one is this morning. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, God is showing forth that no man will be declared righteous by their works. Mm -hmm. It is written, there's 
None righteous, not even one in Romans 3.10. Not even Abel, apart from faith, was righteous. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. For by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast in that. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Moving on to verse 3, right? And I got to do, I did a little speculating here, and I kind of think you have to, which I, I don't really like to do, but to get the background of the what and why that's going on in the story, and you'll see what I mean shortly. So verse 3 says, In the course of time, which in the Hebrew is translated at the end of days, that Cain bought some of the fruit of the ground for an offering to the Lord. The words in the course of time or process in time, it denotes a certain time period has gone by, which we really don't know how long it actually was. It may have been the end of the week, which would have been the Sabbath day. It could have been the, the end of the year or the season of the year where the ingathering of the fruits and the, uh, the firstlings of the flock were born. Or maybe even a possible time that was prescribed by the Lord himself to Adam to bring an offering. Mm -hmm. we, we don't know. Regardless of when or even why it was, it was a time for Cain and Abel to bring an offering to the Lord, possibly even having come to an age of understanding or perhaps even the Lord maybe even wanting to test them. Now again, I, I don't know for sure, but it's, it's my personal opinion just to say that this is the first time Cain and Abel or bringing an offering to the Lord. Mm -hmm. I would think that if a time of giving an offering happened previously, Cain would have known that he and his sacrifice wouldn't have been accepted, and he wouldn't have been so angry about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he already came at one time and presented himself before the Lord with, with the wrong attitude, an offering would be crazy that he would be mad about it again the second time. I mean, I, I don't know, that's my little, if that makes sense. <laughs> But anyway, the scriptures goes on to say that Cain brings an offering of the fruit of the ground, a ground that was cursed, which had to be worked to produce a crop. So by the sweat of his face, the working of his hands, laboring, toiling, Cain brings his offering to the Lord. So in essence, what Cain is saying to the Lord by this offering is, look what I did. Look what I accomplished. I worked the soil. It yielded its fruit to me. Here you go. Here's the working of my hands. And before I go any further, I just want to look quickly at the word offering that's used in this passage. An offering is something we give voluntary, voluntarily, which usually requires some level of sacrifice on our part. For example, we, we give of our income. You know, we take that, what can be used for our personal use, right, for our with our money is our time, we give it to the Lord, or we offer our time, okay, sometimes to help people in need, take away from our time to help someone else in need. Um, when Ornan offered David his threshing floor and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord, David said, I'll offer nothing that is yours to the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Mm -hmm. So sacrifice costs something mm -hmm. to give. And this word offering used here in the Hebrew is the word mincha. It, it, uh, mincha. <laughs> I'm saying, that's, I don't really know. <laughs> that's how it is. And it, and it's because they have, you know, if you go on the computer and you put it in me. I did, right? I know. So when you, because you can, you know, when you put the Google in, it says, uh, uh, you can hit it and it'll say it for you actually online. So it's like, mincha. <laughs> And it, it simply means to give a gift, and it's different from the Hebrew word that denotes a blood sacrifice. Yeah. And the reason I bring this up about the Hebrew meaning word is because there's some people who believe that because the word does not denote a blood sacrifice, that it didn't matter that Cain bought lifeless plants as an offering to the Lord. Some say the real issue with his offering was his lack of faith, that if he had real faith, God would have accepted him which, by the way, I agree with 100%. But they also say that it didn't matter what kind of offering he gave, which I don't agree with, agree with even though that, sir, that word only means to bring a gift. Yeah. Okay? 
It would have been, I mean, it would have been awesome for me when I looked up that word in, in the Hebrew and it meant like up blood sacrifice. It would have put an end to any arguments. Oh, no wonder why he didn't accept Cain's thing. He's, he brought it just a regular, you know, it was just a gift when God calls for a blood sacrifice, but it simply meant to bring a gift. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I believe there needed to be blood, as we'll see. So um, moving on, as we go to verse 4 and look at it, and we'll see what Abel, what he had to offer. It says, Abel, Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions. What Abel offers is the fattest of the firstborn of the flock, which means he's offering that which is best. The firstborn of the flock speaks of that which is not only superior, but also that, is, that which is distinguished over the rest. Now, symbolically speaking, the, the first of the flock represents the Hebrew firstborn son, who has much importance and many privileges and benefits, with, and with a lot of responsibilities came. He was the one who received the double portion of the inheritance. If anything happened to the father, he'd be the one to take care of the family. I'm the firstborn, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one that also opens the mother's womb that would pave the way for the other children. Yeah. Romans 8.29 says, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. It is Christ who paved the way for our salvation being the firstborn. Mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, the Apostle Paul refers to Jesus as being the last Adam, and then in verse 47 as being the second man. In him being the last Adam, he has put an end to a sinful race of people by taking our sin upon himself and burying it with him in his death. We are all one time represented by Adam because we were all born sinners. Now Adam, and in Adam, all die. But now for those who believe, he's done away with. He's the last Adam. That, that's been done with now. But in being the second man, he's the one who makes alive and gives new life, unlike Adam. He's the beginning, the firstborn of a new race of people who have been justified, being declared righteous by faith in him freely by his grace alone. Amen. Colossians 2, 13 15 through 15 says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed, disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to an open shame by triumphing over them in him who is Christ. Amen. And by the way, if you are here today and you're still in Adam and not in Christ, not trusting in the finished work of the cross for your salvation, you have judgment coming. Don't leave here today without putting your faith in Christ. And so we see symbolically by offering up the firstborn of the flock what this actually points to, and that's God's only begotten son. So in saying all that, Abel, Abel didn't just walk into the fold and grab the first sheep he saw. The perfect lamb had to be searched out. It took some time. Goes, skips over the lane, right? Walks by the one with the spots and the blemishes, moves the skinniest of the flock to the side, right? Examine each one till he finds the best, right, to offer to the Lord. No defects, no flaws. Does this qualification sound familiar? Yeah. Of course it does. It points to the life of our risen Savior. It typifies his perfect, sinless nature, which qualifies him to be the sacrifice for our sin. 1 Peter 1, 19, 20 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, like silver or gold, from the aimless conduct received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. 
So we see that Abel's offering of the best of the flock, a living animal, pure and innocent, how it differs greatly from that of Cain's offering that consisted of lifeless herbs. And the Lord had regard for and res or respect for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no respect. If you're wondering how the Lord showed acceptance of Abel's offering and disregard for Cain's, the scripture doesn't really mention how. Something that, you know, I ask, and I'm looking at, like, what the hell, you know, the Lord showed, like, how did they know? You know, offerings were usually laid upon a some type of altar. Did, did they build an offer and offer sacrifice on it? Did fire come down and consume Abel's offering and while Cain's was left untouched? Did they hear an audible voice from heaven giving them the approval of it or not? I mean, the Lord did speak with Cain later on in the story. The answer is we don't know. The, script, the scripture just says he respected one and not the other. So we saw, what Ab we saw that what Abel's offering looked like and pointed to, now let's look at why the Lord had respect for him and his offering and not for Cain's. Mm -hmm. And in order to get a better picture of the life of Abel and what moved him to make such an offering, we'll have to go to the New Testament and look at a few scriptures there and see what they have to say about them. So the first scripture I want to look at is Luke 11, 49 through 51. And just to give a little background before we read it, um, Jesus was invited to the Pharisees, to, uh, Pharisees' home to eat. And as he reclined at the table, the Pharisees were like baffled that he didn't wash his hands before he ate. Mm. Now we know the Pharisees were only concerned about the outwardly. They were dead spiritually, as Jesus even goes on to say to them. They were a group of religious, self-righteous people who were prideful opponents of him. They thought they were pleasing to God because of their strict outward adherence to the law, to the written law, and not only the written law, but the oral law mm -hmm. as well, which was a bunch of man-made laws not recorded in the book of Moses, one of many being this hand-washing -wash ritual that they would go through. So in essence, the Pharisees and lawyers were under the illusion that they had what it took in themselves by their works to be acceptable and right with God. Does this type of attitude sound like someone else we talked about earlier? I think it does. Now, I don't know if he had said something to Jesus about washing his hands, or he just perceived what, they, what, what the Pharisee was thinking, but Jesus goes on to pronounce judgment on the Pharisees for the hypocrisy, followed by the judgment upon the lawyers. So that's the background. So Luke 11, 49 through 51 says, Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel, Matthew's account says righteous Abel, to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the temple. Yes, I say to you, it shall be required of this generation. So wait, the scripture says that Abel was a prophet. Now, a prophet is one who proclaims the word of the Lord. He was a mouthpiece for God. And more times than not, he was call, his call was to call people to repentance, calling people back to God or turning people initially to God, as we see written all over the New Testament. Mm -hmm. We see Malachi, Zechariah, Micah, Jeremiah, Elijah, and so on calling verbally for rebellious and backslidden people to repentance, to be right with God. But ironically enough, there is not one recorded word in Scripture able uttering anything at all. Both the Old Testament and the New Testament have no recorded word that he spoke, and yet Jesus referred to him as a prophet. And not only a prophet, but he also implied he was the first person martyred for his faith. He was from righteous Abel. Amen. They murdered. Amen. So being a prophet then, we can maybe imply that in his day, he may have been heard proclaiming the way of righteousness or maybe even calling for repentance. I don't know how many people around during this time, we know Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters, the scripture goes on to say. Were there other children around at this time of the story of Cain and Abel? Eve had to have daughters about that time since the scripture says Cain goes and has relations with his wife after the Lord kicks him out from, you know, 
drip drives him from the ground in Genesis 4.17. We know after Abel was killed, she gave birth to Seth. Were there any other sons born that the scripture's silent on after Abel or born in between Cain and Abel? I don't know, but I don't know. So it's possible that Abel could have been proclaiming the way of righteousness to these people. But if there was no one, other people around, there was Cain. Cain was there. We could be certain of that. John, 1 John 3.12 says that Cain was of the evil one and he murdered his brother because his deeds and works were evil and his brothers were righteous. Perhaps Abel would say to Cain, you know, brother, you really need to change your ways. You're not living right before God. You really need to repent. You know what the Lord requires of us. Maybe that's why Cain was so incredibly angry when his offering wasn't accepted. There may have been some animosity building up in him towards Abel. He saw him possibly as a, as a pious, you know, maybe saw Abel as a pious individual. I don't know, but look how infuriated the Pharisees of Jesus' day were with him because of the truth in which he spoke. You see, the truth will either drive you to the cross of Calvary or cause you to despise it. Jesus said in John 8, 37, and speaking of the Pharisees, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. And it did find a place in Cain. And what did the Pharisees end up doing to Jesus? They called for his crucifixion. They murdered him. And what did Cain do to his brother? He murdered him. And when I asked early in describing the heart and, atti in describing the heart and attitude of the Pharisees, <clears throat> does this remind you of anyone? Of course, I was alluding to Cain. Jude compares the false teacher of his day with Cain. He's saying, woe to them that you have walked in the way of Cain. That's because they were filled with pride and arrogance, as Cain was. The scripture says Cain, was of, he was of the evil one. He was the first <laughs> offspring of the serpent who was in enmity with his brother, right off the bat. Who did Jesus say the Pharisees were of? Their father, the devil, the evil one. He was a murderer from the beginning, just like Cain. Pharisees, both of who cut the lies of Abel and Christ short. Perhaps that's why his name was Abel, which means breath or, or vapor, because he was cut off from the land of the living, as Christ was, due to sinners like you and I. If Cain doesn't represent the spirit of the Pharisee in Jesus' day and Abel doesn't foreshadow Christ, I don't know who does. So seeing Abel was a prophet who typified Christ, and if he really never did say a word, I tell you that not only did his actions alone testify to his prophetic ministry, that the offering gave pointed to something greater, but also his actions point to the faith that he carried inside his heart. So just to elaborate on this a little, Hebrews 11, verse 4, it says, By faith, Abel offered God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. I love the fact that it says he still speaks at the end because of the ironing at irony, as I already mentioned, he never spoke anything as far as the scriptures are concerned. However, it shows that what he did speaks. Amen. If we have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. You see, Abel's, Abel's actions authenticated the faith that he held onto in his heart. His sacrifice showed that he trusted in another, not only to have a righteousness imputed to him, but also for his redemption. The type of sacrifice he gave being a prophet, and a prophet being one who also would proclaim things that were to come, points to a time when Christ would come to earth and redeem not only him, but us from the curse of sin and death by the shedding of his blood. Amen. This is why the scripture says at the end of Hebrews 11, 4, that he still speaks. Because what he did then spoke prophetically, and it still speaks now. It's still the way to justification for us 
today. And Abel understood this. It was the working of faith inside him that motivated him to bring a sacrifice such as this. It's what James says in chapter 2, verse 17, that faith by itself, if it does not have works, it's dead. So it just may have been that it was the testimony of his actions and not his words at all that made Jesus say of him that he was a prophet. Some say of Cain that he wasn't accepted because he didn't give the first and the best of his offering. And that it may have been like his, his leftovers. That if he gave the first and best, that he would have been accepted. The real issue though, and I hope I was able to make myself clear to you through this message, is that he had no faith. If he did, he wouldn't have offered lifeless herbs from a cursed ground that had to be worked to bring forth the fruit of it. He wouldn't have bought a bloodless offering. He would have went to his brother, dropped off some of the herbs he just picked to give to his brother E. Abel, I'm grabbing one of the uh, first in the flock for our offering today. Abel would have said, cool, see you there. Okay, brother. No one approaches God and comes into his presence without being covered by the blood of the Lamb, Amen. namely Christ. It is by faith alone in Christ's sacrifice that we will boldly come to his throne of grace. And I just want to close with, with one last scripture, Hebrews 12, 24. It says, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Abel's blood was spilt on a cursed earth, and it accomplished zero, zero for us. It only cried out for judgment against his murderer, for judgment against the sinner. Christ's blood, on the other hand, was spilt on this earth that was cursed due to sin, but unlike Abel's blood, Christ's blood speaks forth that of mercy, Hallelujah. forgiveness, Amen. redemption, Amen. which every single one of us here needs today. Amen. And has just as much power now as it did then to break the power of sin and death in whosoever comes to him and to destroy every stronghold that would keep us from walking in an abiding union with him. Amen. 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 Let's just let's bow and pray. Yes. Father God, we just we're in awe of you, God, yes. for what you've done for us, Lord yes. God. We don't take it lightly, your death on the cross, Lord. We thank you that you willingly sent your son to die for us, Lord God. Lord, I thank you that you are all over the word of God, Lord, that the, your word is the complete revelation of the Messiah. So, Lord, we just bless you. We thank you for that sacrifice, Lord. I just pray just um, a blessing over each one here, Lord, as we go through our day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.